boxing fixture. Boxer, amateur trainer, pro trainer, face and fixture. Not just on the London scene, but on the boxing scene. Now, he's been all over the place, to be very honest with you. I know he's just come back from Dubai, where he gave a boxing seminar. Now, I spoke to Johnny earlier, and I started by asking him when his boxing days started. It started when I was about... Well, first off, it was 11 years of age. I, the same normal scenario of what you hear, 11... There was an older kid lived in my block that used to go to Broad Street Boxing Club. And uh, he was about four, three or four years older than me. Got speaking to him, got interested in it, and uh, went along to Broad Street with him. Was it was Broad Street on the highway then, or just on yes, the highway the, then? Yes, yeah, the in, in Bellow Street School, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Johnny Cleed was still the trainer there, yeah. as he is now. <laughs> and uh, he must be older than life itself, Johnny, now. But, um, he hasn't changed, though. Not at all. He's been aged in no, 40 no, years, hasn't he? Not at all, no, not at all. But um, I... Uh, at 11 years of age, I spent about six weeks there or something like that. And uh, after my first little sparring session, I had a fat lip and that. And my mum wouldn't let me go back no more. So I never went back no more until I was 16, 17. And went back to Broad Street Went then. back to Broad Street because uh, two friends of mine, Joey Williams and uh, Mickey Williams, was both boxing there. And uh, I decided, because I was playing football then, decided to give it a go on the fitness side and just ended up getting hooked on it. Then I got in a little bit of trouble and I uh, went on holiday for a little while. And... Uh, Come back out. Did you go back in? Come back, back out it? when I was nineteen, and uh, had my first fight when I was nineteen. That's odd, isn't it? I didn't realise. Yeah. I didn't realise you'd, you'd had that fight so late. Yeah, I didn't. I had my fight. I fought a guy named Joe Lewis. My first fight. Oh. He was with St Peter's over South London. <laughs> and uh, when I mentioned his name, obviously it frightened me a little bit. <laughs> so every time he threw a punch, I threw myself on the floor. And he, without he even landing, and the referee went out to do kid, and he just stopped. I got stopped in the first round. Yeah. <laughs> How many bouts did you have as, as an amateur? Because I know that I know that Mick... it was over the forty, Steve. Yeah, yeah. And, so, and and I was sort of half and half. But didn't Mick Carney take you away on a trip once? Mick he Carney. tells a story. Was it somewhere like somewhere like Amsterdam or Copenhagen? No, or no, no. It was London, Lon v London, Stoke on Trent. Stoke on Trent. Yeah, Lon it, it, London. I told you it was exotic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Lon London v the Arm uh, London v Army, and uh, that was the whole lot of my amateur career boxing for London twice, and. Uh, Still got the vest. Yeah, on the on on the <laughs> way up, um, I think they took it back off me because I put in such a bad performance. <laughs> I give it back on the coach. But, um, no, uh, on the way up, there was uh, Jimmy Cable and myself. Oh well. And uh, Mick kind of decided to change the opponents and put me in with who Cable was supposed to be boxing. Okay. And Cable in with who I was boxing. And don't tell me Cable you know, had the bow out and around. Man over and around. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought a guy named Trevor Arty. I don't even remember Trevor Arty. No, I can't place He it. was number one in the light heavyweights, uh, won three ABA titles, and there was me having my 18th foul or something. <laughs> and uh, stuck me in with his guys, and he bowled me over in the second round with a body shot. <laughs> and did and Jimmy buy you a drink at least on nah, the way nah. back? <laughs> like, buy him a drink. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, no, yeah. And did, did you end up at West? Then you end up at West Ham tra Not, tra yeah, as a trainer. As I, a trainer. I, what I did. Uh, um, what happened there? I was I was going to go professional and. Uh, Again, following Joey and Mickey Williams, really, sure. they went pro with Harry, Harry Burgess. Remember Harry the Growler? Yeah, of course I do, yeah. And I was training over the Beckett, and um, uh, I'd just been in the ABAs, and I got beat by Les Stewart in the ABAs. Who um, boxed for the Reps and went on to win a world title. World heavyweight champion. Yeah. He had to lead the country a bit sharpish. Probably. He did, yeah. <laughs> yeah probably. And then he showed up later on. Yeah. And it, was, it was Les Stewart, Trinidad and Tobago, That's as opposed it. to Les Stewart of Bethel the East End. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, I, I was going to go pro, and, and then I was over the Beckett, and, and I was talking to the to the pros over there and back in the 70s you know it weren't the medical the medical uh, rules and regulations what we've got in the pro game yeah. now it was a little bit lax the days ago and uh, yeah. a lot of the fighters I was talking to was badly punched drunk syndrome you know flat nose chronic bare ears and puffy and I thought myself you know what ain't for me this ain't for me and uh, I was 24 then 24, 25 I think and uh, I'd already been helping to train the juniors at Broad Street while I was fighting Okay. and it just seemed a natural step Steve so mm. I went on a course with Broad Street and uh, I actually only coached for a year there and I then opened my own club in Poplar called Lansbury. Oh, I can remember that briefly yeah. Yeah I had it running for about five years. Yeah. They've now reopened again Adam Spelling's running it at the moment. Okay. Um, but then Bradley Stone passed away yep. and, and uh, to be honest with you it upset me a little bit and I, and I packed up being the trainer. But I, had a, I had about four months out Steve I think. Uh, after Bradley? After Bradley. I just, yeah, I just, yeah I just thought you know I don't know, I just couldn't face it. Yeah. He was he was a nice kid, and it? It, it was hard, it was hard to accept. Although he was a little bit of a tear away on the yeah, street, yeah. he was a lovely kid. And then Jimmy Murphy from West Ham knocked on, he used to live around the corner to where my mum lived, knocked on the door and said, why don't you come and give it a roll at West Ham? 
Jimmy Murphy, by the way, is the, w w died last year and certainly one of the most knowledgeable most knowledgeable men you ever meet inside amateur boxing. In fact, his funeral was attended by people from all over Britain. It was yeah. quite staggering, it wasn't was, it? I know it was amazing, yeah. It was amazing, yeah. So um, he said, come and give it a go, Dan. He said, come and give it a go. I started with a nursery. Mm. Um, which was full of good fighters, which I was imagine. Full, yeah. Well, in the nursery, there was the likes of Kevin Neer and people yeah. like that. Talk so about so, Kevin in a minute, yeah. Yeah. And then, um, you know, uh, it just progressed to there. Then I was sort of, there was me, um, at that time, Lee Tokely. Yeah, yeah. They're one of the Tokelys. Yeah, yeah. And Mickey. Mickey, Mickey, mate. Yeah, then, then Lee went and then Terry Abbott come along. Yeah, from, used to be Crown, uh, Tate and Lyle. Tate and Lyle. Yeah. Terry's back there again now, apparently. Um, and I ended up there for 14, 15 years, Stephen. Wow. Uh, so know. when did you take your pro licence out then to be a trainer? Uh, every year in, in, in the amateur, well, I, had, I had quite a while with Mickey with the juniors yeah. and then Dave Woodward, who was the senior coach, then moved on to Newham. Yep. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to coach the seniors. Well, I was help, sort of helping out with the seniors anyway, and yeah, a lot of the good juniors we had were, just, had gone were just moving into the seniors. Um, and uh, it just seemed a natural progression, and I started doing that. And uh, every year, someone wants to go pro, and it's like, yeah, I'm going to go with them, but then you get attached to another kid, then, so you leave that then one Then it's away. the next year, yeah. and they've gone. And then I had Gary Stedman. I don't even remember yeah, Gary. Of course I do, yeah. Funnily um, enough, I was at Gary's first ever bout. Okay. Yeah, but I did barking. a feature on his very, very barking, first ever yeah. bout, yeah, and, he, and I think he lost, if I'm not mistaken. No, we no, they didn't lose, no. We did, did he, he got disqualified on one boat and got through. I know, I, did, I know I did something on Gary Stedman years yeah. ago for the Telegraph yeah. when I was working there, yeah. and I, mem I remember we've got a picture of him in the corner. I mean, yeah. he well, probably was the disqualification. Yeah, he, they both got disqualified, but that's another story. But Gary went pro, but I had Kevin and Kevin Lear, that is, yeah. and, and uh, uh, Tony Joy. Yeah. Kevin came back that year. Yeah. He, he's packed up when he was 16 and came then back. Then came back. Came yeah. back and we put him straight in the AVAs. And, and I stayed for the AVAs, but I was coaching Gary as a pro. Yeah. Who was then managed by Dean Powell. Yeah. And Dean used to do his corner for me. Sure. So, so um, but then the following year, Kevin got beat in the AVA finals. Yeah, I remember that. And then he wanted to go pro. And I thought, you know, you know what, it's time for me to go. And, and, and I did. So, so, so what year was that, 99 or something? 15, 14, yeah. 15 years now. Oh, yeah. so about 97, 98. Because yeah. Kev Kevin's, Kevin's, Kevin's odd. His career's odd in the sense that he's only pro. So he's only a pro three years. Wins a version of the world title. Great performance against Gomez. Has yeah. one defence. Two thousand and two. Still only a baby. And then vanishes off the face of the earth. Whatever happened to Kevin Lear? Kevin used to have a lot of problems. With the, the problem with Kevin is he was so naturally talented. Yeah. That he felt he didn't have to put the eight weeks in for title fights. Okay. He was one of them kids. And in the end, I was, we used to have to kidnap him and take him to training camp. Otherwise, you wouldn't get the the quality training out of him when he was when he trained properly he, he, you know you, you don't like yeah, cool. like Kevin Lear um, he uh, but he because he wasn't giving you the eight weeks or ten weeks what you what you need yeah. to get ready for a 12 round fight he was coming in and having to work hard straight away and that was okay. his whole career yeah. you know he never actually runs till he started doing eight round fights oh, he just used to get through on talent just, alone yeah and he was you know, super talented yeah, and the talent was there that's why yeah. and then he started having problems with his shoulder. Oh, okay. Because it was an injury. Kept dropping out. Well. Kept dropping oh, out. Um, we we got him uh, over Chelsea Football Club with a physio over there. They had a, they had a rugby, the the England rugby physio working with Chelsea at the time. I forget his name now, but he specialised in shoulder injuries. And Joe Dunbar, you know Joe, you yeah, yeah. Joe found him for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Joe found him for us, and we used to have to go to Chelsea one or two nights a week and have this physio with this guy. And it seemed to be strengthening it up. And we beat Gomez. That was in two, 2002. Which was, I mean, it was only Kevin's 11th fight. That yeah, was it was staggering, half, yeah. You know what I mean? We then fought um, Kirkhoff Kirkhoff, That's I right. believe. Who was a decent fight. Who was a good, good champion. Yeah. I mean, he was, was still dec he was still decent. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 yeah. Still, that was He's a been good about week. recently or, yeah, or yeah. after. But well, that was 2002, yeah. so it's different. And we was then penciled in to fight um, Gavin Reese. Gavin Reese, yeah, oh, sure. So we had shit. We had, who just won a prize fighter, the Mongolian. Oh, Choi. 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 I was him for Choi as a sparring partner. Yeah. Wow. And and Kevin Kevin uh, Kevin for a right hand. Choi got underneath it, and it and his, as he stood out, it popped his shoulder out again. And he was I never I never get the pain he was in. He was in really excruciating pain, Steve. And uh, he just said, you know what, John, I can't go through this. No There's only 25, only 24, yeah, 25. Yeah, yeah. He said I can't do this no more. And because it was reoccurring all the and time. And that was it. Just it gone. had it had one operation on it. What it actually did they took open the shoulder up. And the, and the the bone had been chipping away, and it was all chipped bone. Oh. So you imagine the pain. 
So they cleaned all that out, redone his tendons, but it was still falling out, and he just went in half. And that was it. So, and and that didn't think like two years later, three years later, when he was only twenty. He spoke, about, he spoke about it a few times. But no, no it, it never materialised. Now at that time, John, did you have the gym you've got at the moment, the one in Canning no, in, in, was, in Canning Town, at that, the Trad or no, TKO? No, no, no. At that, at that time, I'd, I'd just moved from Broad Street, um, and and I was using West Ham Boxing Club. Okay. I was back in here and it was using it for daytime. So how did you end up in the place you're in at the moment? Because I mean, it's it's one it's one of the it's a, it's an old throwback gym. It's like something from the seventies or the fifties. People talk about these gyms yeah. and they say they don't exist. Well, your place is, I mean, it, 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 it's a ridiculous place. It's 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 a classic yeah. old, old style. How did you end up in that venue? I, I mean, we, we was pretty fortunate. I mean, I ended up training Ross Minter. Yeah. Um, who was sponsored by a guy called Tony Brinton, um, who owns Ultra Chem. Okay, which of course, are, Ultra Chem was... Which are, they, they supply everything to the printing trade, uh, all bar ink, I think. But they're, they're a mega, big company. And uh, t Tony's printing was sponsoring Ross, who um, it enabled Ross to pack up work and become a full-time fighter, which we yeah. all saw the improvement in when he could do that. Absolutely different you know, fighter. Different then. fighter. Um, uh, obviously, I, Tony used to come along, come along and watch Ross training every day and see where his investment was going and what he was doing. And we became friends, and uh, he, he then took over from our sponsor because uh, we had a sponsor who used to pay the rent for us at West Ham, and, and uh, uh, different things happened. And then he couldn't sponsor us no more. So Tony said, Well, I'll take over that. And then we was at one Christmas dinner, and, and Tony was one of these guys. He'd always want to ask you what you was planning to do in the future. And he said, You know, what, get, you know what's your wish list for next year? And as much as I loved working in the amateur clubs, and especially West Ham, because sure. it was a club I was there for a long while. The amateur committees are very petty. Yeah, and, of course and, you, know, you know, your boys left a bit of tape on the side oh, yeah. and, you know, you sweet rapping. You know, sw yeah, of course. You know, and, and in the end, it was doing me editing. And, and I said, I'd love to eventually have my own gym. And he went, all right, I'll put some fault into it. Well, within within two months, I had a big pile of papers saying, go and look at this, go and look at that. And uh, Tony's got a warehouse around the corner to where we're actually sit situated now, one of his warehouses. And he put this this place up, and I went and looked at it, and it was a, a working print factory, Steve. I walked in there. Upstairs. I, upstairs. There was a print factory downstairs, print factory. And I went, phone up, I said, Tony, you know what? I can't see this, mate. It was in a desolate industrial area. And, oh, it's desolate. You know, you and, got and, and, you got know, it. it ain't the sort of place you'd be wanting to walk along, especially in Canning Town anyway, <laughs> but down there over night time, and I, I just couldn't see it. Anyway, he went and looked himself the following day, and he phoned me up and he said, I've done the deal. And I thought, I oh, said, leave it to me. And, and, and obviously you've seen the outcome. Yeah, yeah. He actually rebuilt a whole lot inside for us. Well, the good thing about all those buildings on both all those streets down there, because there is all it's like there's um, recycling plants, there's the bus depot, it's it's grimy, there's garages, yeah. it's filthy. But all those buildings are solid, aren't they? They've solid, got these monster solid. monster concrete yeah, floors, so yeah. you get that's why you can have as many yeah, people as you've yeah. got in there.